patient Griselda. Once upon a time, there was a nobleman called Walter, who was both good and powerful, much beloved by his people. After a time, when he had not married, they sent a deputation to him, saying, Marquis, please marry a wife, so that we may have your son to take your place when you are gone from us. And he replied, I shall marry when I find one whom I can love and find suitable. So they had to be content. Now there was a poor man living humbly with his daughter Griselda near a well of fresh water. Walter was riding by when he saw the girl, tall and beautiful, carrying a pot of water on her head. He asked her for a drink, and then noticing that she was lovelier than any woman he had ever seen, wished to marry her. In her one simple smock and bare foot, she arrived at the castle. Women attendants bathed her, dressed her in fine clothes, and prepared her for marriage to their noble lord. After the extravagant wedding and great rejoicing of the people, Walter took Griselda into a private room and said, Now, wife, you must obey me in all that I wish, and respect my thoughts and commands, whatever they may be. So she promised that she would, and for a while they were very happy indeed. In a year's time a daughter was born to them, a very beautiful child, as fair as her mother. Now came the first great test of Griselda's married life. Her husband came to her and said, The people who love me are dissatisfied with you. They say that I should not have married someone in such a low station of life as yourself. They do not wish me to have children by you, so the child must be taken away and killed. Griselda was stricken to the heart, but she knew she must do everything her husband required, so she agreed to have the child taken away to be killed in a remote spot. As the huntsman came in to drag the little girl from her arms, she held her for just a moment, and said calmly to him, Do bury her deep in the earth when it is done, that she will not be torn by wild beasts. Then she kissed her daughter, and sat silently for a while. Not for a moment did she think ill of her husband, or cry out in her pain. Her life with Walter continued as before, with but one difference, that she never mentioned her daughter's name. Another year passed, and a son of great beauty was born to Griselda. The loss of the other child seemed to have faded from her mind as Griselda cradled her son in her arms, singing to him softly as she fed him. Walter appeared to be satisfied with her, and it seemed that all was well with their life together. But when the boy was two years old, Griselda had a severe test of her love for her husband. He once more said to her, Wife! The people are very distressed in case the grandson of a peasant like your father should inherit my land and rule them. They demand that he, too, be taken from you and killed. It is my will that this should be done. And he left her without another word. Patient Griselda held the child for the last time and kissed it. Then she said to the same huntsman who had taken away her daughter, Bury the body deep in the earth, where no beasts or birds of prey can reach him. And without so much as a tear, she handed over the infant, wrapped in his warmest clothes against the morning's chill. After that day she did not speak of the baby, yet she treated her husband with the same tenderness and respect as always. She ran the great house with perfect calm and dignity as if indeed she had been a true noblewoman instead of a poor peasant's daughter, brought up in poverty. Now in reality, Walter was not guilty of his children's murder, but had dispatched them to his sister's country estate, there to be brought up in luxury and kindness by her. He thought to test Griselda, hoping to find in her character some flaw, some chink in that armour of calm, that goodness of spirit and heart which he could scarcely believe was true and real. For, he thought, she cannot be as good and as true as she appears, devoted to me even after these apparently savage acts of mine. 
yet I will test her further. So he said to her, Griselda, I have some news for you which I must tell you now. For some time past, my life has not been happy, and my love for you has died. My marriage to you was obviously a great mistake. No one was pleased with my marrying a girl of such low degree. My friends will not receive me because of this, and I have now sent for an annulment. You must stop wearing the clothes which should grace a wife of mine, and return to wearing the smock in which you came here. Soon the noble lady whom I am to marry will be coming. Please get the castle in order for her to take over. See to it that everything is replenished and fresh for her. Do you understand what I have said? he asked, for she did not even change her expression of calm serenity as he was speaking. Yes, my lord, said Griselda, smoothing the fine dress she was wearing with her slim hands. I understand. All will be done as you desire. Just let me remove these fineries and I will take the cleaning of the rooms as my own personal responsibility. I wish you every good fortune in your new happiness. And she went away to remove her clothes. She had preserved in her chest the plain, simple smock in which she had arrived. This she took out and put on. Her jewels, furs, silks and fine shoes she returned to Walter and took up her task as housekeeper with much enthusiasm. What went on in her mind and heart no one knew. It did not appear to her that she was badly done by at all, for she just thought she was making good her promise to Walter when he married her, that she would carry out without question everything required of her. She visited her father in his simple house and spent a day with him telling him what had happened. You must return here, he cried. I may be a peasant, but you are my beloved daughter, and I will look after you as I did before. I always knew that this would happen. It is not natural that one so highborn as he should take one such as we are for his wife. I will have to go back and prepare everything for the wedding feast, said Griselda, with simple dignity. I have been asked to attend to it, and attend to it I shall. Afterwards, when they are married, I will come back home. So she went back to the castle, walking strongly away in her bare feet, the white smock her only garment. Now the noble Walter had sent a letter to his sister, asking her to send with all speed, dressed in fine clothes and jewels, his daughter. The girl was like a princess, tall and fair, and was most excited about the journey upon which she was going, in her aunt's wonderful coach and six horses, but she knew not why. Her younger brother, now a handsome stripling, as good-looking as his father had been at the time of the marriage to Griselda, came too. They both were brought swiftly to the castle and led to the guest chambers. Griselda was waiting at the door with fresh flowers for the supposed bride and gave them to her with charming grace. Walter called Griselda to him and asked, Is she not beautiful, my new bride? And Griselda answered, Yes, my lord, she is fair. But, and this is the only thing I would like to say to you, I pray you treat this young princess with greater care than you did me for as she is so delicate and gently born, she might not be able to bear what I have done unquestioningly and faithfully, and her heart might break. Then she went away to prepare the wedding feast with the other servants. The whole castle was decorated with flowers and ribbons, flags and fine carpets were hung from the balconies, music and singing came from the minstrel's gallery. People arrived from every part of Walter's dominions to do him honour at his wedding. Still, patient Griselda attended to every detail, waiting upon the lady and her young brother herself, seeing that everything was to their liking. The nobleman called Griselda to him and said, Look, does she not have every feature as you once had when you were young and my wife? Will you not consider her a suitable wife for me as my people do? and wish her every good fortune. He looked at her very strangely, waiting to hear her reply. Yes, my lord, she answered. She is indeed very fair and young, 
and I wish you all joy with each other. Her eyes were raised to his, and in them he read all that was true, faithful and honest. His heart smote him, and he seized her hands in his, pulling himself to his feet. Dearest Griselda, he cried, forgive me, for I have tested you cruelly, but I had to know if you really loved me enough to suffer all these things for my sake. No, sweet and faithful wife, that this princess whom I have brought here and her brother are none other than our own dear children, whom you believed dead. Come, let me place this fur robe upon you, and I pray that you will take your seat here beside me at the table, so that you will, for the rest of our lives, be my own beloved wife. Then at last did Griselda's tears fall, and she wept as she embraced her long-lost daughter and her handsome son, and thanked God that they were returned to her. She swooned twice, and each time her husband raised her up with loving hands. And Walter, his misgivings about her dispelled, did everything in his power to make her forget the dreadful years of her testing. They lived devoted to each other and to their children for the rest of their days, as happy as true and faithful lovers can. Griselda's father, after he understood the tale they told him, was brought to the castle, and he, too, lived the rest of his life in comfort and tranquility, free of all care.